Welcome to the Leadership for Society speaker series. The theme this year is tensions, business, civic society, and politics. And I'm Brian Lowry, professor of organizational behavior at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And today I'm speaking with Sir Angus Deaton, senior scholar and Dwight D. Eisenhower, professor of economics and international affairs emeritus at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and the Economics Department at Princeton University, and the winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Economics. Um, Sir Angus is the author of numerous books, um, which recently includes Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism, written with his collaborator Anne Case, and most recently, Economics in America, an immigrant econo economist explores the land of inequality. Thanks for being here, Angus. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Fantastic. So in your book, uh, Economics in America, you write that as a Scot, you viewed the government as a friend. But when you came to the U.S., colleagues told you that the government is an enemy. They view it as an enemy. Why do you think there's such a, a difference um, between the way you viewed government and the way some of your um, American colleagues did? Well, uh, if I can start with the British version first, I mean, <laughs> the government really was my yeah. friend. and It was my parents' friend. And, you know, I was born pretty much the same time as the National Health Service in Britain. And the National Health Service was something that was regarded as a wonderful treasure by my parents and all their cohort. They'd grown up pretty poor. Um, my mother was the daughter of artisans, my father, coal miner. And they just didn't have access to those things, and suddenly they did. And immediately after the war, the National Health Service was providing all sorts of child support things, you know, mm -hmm. like cod liver oil and orange juice and other things that were hard to get immediately after the war. And my mother had always taught me that, you know, if I was in trouble, ask a policeman, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that worked for me, at least in Britain. It didn't work so well when I got here. Um, and to come to the American side, I don't think everybody I met thought that. And, mm -hmm. you know, but... What I encountered for the first time was the person who quoted Proudhon, which is government is theft, mm. um, was a true libertarian. And, you know, that wasn't the mainstream position. <laughs> mm -hmm. And not everybody thought that. I mean, and, you know, most Americans, I don't think, think that the government is incapable of ha helping its citizens. But there is a level of suspicion and there is this far out wing which is very vocal a lot of the time, arguing that the government can only harm and cannot help. And that, I don't believe that now. And, you know, I didn't believe it then. <laughs> Got it. You know, what's interesting about that, the idea of government as theft is the tax rate in, in Britain, as I understand it, is much higher in most, in most of Europe than it is in the United States. Yet still, there's a greater concern about taxation in the, in the United States among the general populace. What, what do you think that's that's about? Is it is it just is it ideology? Is it something about the Protestant work ethic in the states, or you know, or is it something about the way the government operates? Do you think? Um, I think um, there's a lot to that question, and we could unpack um, different parts of it. I think um, we do have higher taxes in Britain and in Europe in general. So Europe, a very simple way of thinking about it is that. The EU in Britain has a value-added tax on goods, um, which runs, I think, about 17% or something. That raises a lot of money, and that money is used to support a welfare state, um, which is much more comprehensive than anything we have here. Americans don't have that. They don't have a very comprehensive welfare state. Mm -hmm. And I think what you say is true. I think I, history is tied up with the ideology. I mean, a lot of people came to this country, <laughs> the ones that came here voluntarily at least, mm -hmm. came here in order to escape um, from what they regarded as oppressive governments. So I think there's a longstanding belief in America that, you know, if you just, they have different preferences, if you like. Um, that in, in America, people believe in being left alone to get on with their thing and are prepared to accept the consequences. And that's less true um, in Europe. Of course, the ineffectiveness of government can be a self-fulfilling prophecy too. 
you know, and I, you know, we could talk about that a bit too, but especially when people keep beating up on government and refuse to fund it, you know, the IRS would be a case in point right now mm -hmm. where the Republican Party is trying very hard to defund the IRS, which would make it much less effective, especially ineffective in collecting taxes from the rich donors who fund them. Mm -hmm. So you get some of that self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. And, and, you know, in this conversation, it seems it can for many people, it can seem high level. We're talking about government and taxation and the welfare state, and it affects people's lives. But sometimes in the conversations, I mean, I think the policy is at a level that feels removed from every from the every people's everyday life. But in your recent work that, that's gotten a lot of attention, you talk about deaths of despair. And so I'd love to um, for you to tell us what you mean by deaths of despair. Just describe what that is meant to uh, entail. Okay, so the term is actually was invented by Anne Case. I was having a hip replaced at that point, and she was describing in an article in Quartz hmm. um, this work, and she used the term "they were dying of despair." So we'd written in a paper in 2015 um, about <clears throat> an increase in mortality in midlife for white non-Hispanics, both men and women. Um, and, you know, that's a major group. It's certainly not the whole population. Um, and, you know, mortality goes down, it doesn't go up. And, you know, this was a sufficiently unusual event to attract a great deal of attention at the time. And so when we first discovered that, sort of fell over that by accident, we were curious about two things. One was, what are they dying from? And so we thought, well, there's something spiking there that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And the three things that were spiking, the biggest one was um, accidental overdoses, <clears throat> which appear in the official statistics as poisonings, which we thought was very odd. Mm -hmm. You know, are people drinking Drano by accident mm -hmm. or something? No, well, they were um, dying from drug overdoses. Mm -hmm. And alcoholic liver disease, you know, which is another self-inflicted mm -hmm. thing, and suicide, which is the ultimate self-inflicted thing. So we grouped those three together because they seem to have a common factor, which was this self-inflicted mess. Um, not because they always went together, but because, you know, what would your life have to be like before you were susceptible to taking drugs that might kill you or committing suicide or drinking to excess. So that seemed like, you know, and we were sort of into dark time and all that sort of thing that people's lives were coming apart. And then we looked at who was dying, which was the other part of it. And what we discovered, we were working with death certificates and there's not a huge amount of information on the death certificate, you know, you know when you died and what you died of. But it does, since 1992, actually have people's highest educational attainment on the death certificate. Mm. <clears throat> and what we discovered was that if you had a four-year BA, you were sort of exempted from this increase in death. Whereas if you did not have a four-year BA, which is two-thirds of the population, then that was the um, that was the group who was suffering this increase in mortality. So <clears throat> that was the original story, and of course we thought we must have got it wrong because you know someone must have noticed this. They really hadn't. There, were, there was a lot of emphasis in the literature at the time on the narrowing gap in mortality between whites and blacks, mm -hmm. um, and people were rightly celebrating that. Um, and some of that was because of falling mortality for blacks, but no one seemed to have emphasized the fact that part of that was rising mortality for whites. And so, you know, that was a big deal then. It's less of a deal now because the drug deaths um, and even the suicides and alcohol, a couple of years later, our data finished in 2013 at that time, that, you know, those deaths are in the African-American community now too. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about the, the spike because I don't know what you say and maybe it started, you noticed the spike in 2015. Is that right? Around there? Um, we were writing the paper in 2015, but our latest data were 2013. So it was 2015. really early in the 21st century. 
Got it. And you know, I want what what changed? What do you think accounted for that that increase? I mean, there's the conversation about opioids, but you're talking about more than just that. So, uh, what do you think shifted well, around that the conversation that included opioids? And mm -hmm. you know, we don't think people are susceptible to opioids unless something else has gone wrong in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so, there's wonderful work that was done in Vietnam where people were using opioids servicemen, American servicemen were using opioids very heavily. And, you know, when they came home, the addiction just vanished. <laughs> so they were using opium in Vietnam, largely because they were bored out of their minds and they were not living in a functioning social structure. Mm. And when they went home to that, it just sort of evaporated. So we think of these drugs as, as part of, you know, part of a, a non-functional um, society in which less educated Americans were living. The thing that we missed in that original paper, because it was not rising very fast, but the fact that it was rising at all was important, was the falling mortality from cardiovascular disease, which had mm -hmm. been the main force in increasing life expectancy up to the end of the 20th century had slowed down for everyone and actually reversed among people who did not have a BA. Um, and who knows, we, that's not well understood. A lot of people like to link it to obesity, mm. but we don't know that for sure. And there are holes in that argument, but <clears throat> we felt, you know, and this is obviously the facts are not really disputable, but what is disputable is our claims that we're linking this back to, you know, a world that's turned against working class Americans. And it's become very much harder for Americans who don't have a four year college degree. And we link that to trade and automation and, you know, the legal system moving against working people and increasing profits relative to wages and mm -hmm. more monopsony and monopoly. You know, there's a whole swathe of social dysfunctions. Mm -hmm. that we think are affecting less educated people much more. Mm -hmm. So, because one of the things that I'm most interested in when the, because when you say deaths of despair, it brings to mind like a loneliness or depression. And you talked about in Vietnam, the servicemen being um, bored and not in a functioning social system. Why, why did that change in the state? So it sounds like you're suggesting that civic life kind of broke down or shifted in some significant way. Uh, in early 21st century, and I'm I'm curious, what you, what how do we understand that? What's the relationship between that right. and the economy? <clears throat> well, um, it's not a tight one, and it's not high frequency. So you know, we had this financial crisis, 2007, 2008, and if you look at these deaths during that period, they were going up before, they went up during, they went up afterwards. So it's not to do with the business cycle. So our claim is this is a much slower process that's been going on for a long time. You know, you go back to the 50s and 60s, up until about 1970, you know, that was probably a very good time for at least white working class Americans. There was what they called the blue collar aristocracy, you know, so people working in steelworks or car plants, you know, could afford a house, they could afford a car, a nice television. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like the ones we have now, but still. And they could go on holiday, and th there was this sort of real sense of rising living standards at that time. But real wages for men without a BA have really not moved much since 1970. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been good stuff in the last year or two, but who knows whether that will, will last. Mm -hmm. um, and there were improvements for African Americans for a while, but there's not been a huge amount of progress since then. Um, you know, there's been a huge loss of power for working class Americans. So there's like no unions left anymore, at least in the mm. private sector. And those unions were important socially. They were important politically. They brought power to the labor movement. They monitored conditions at work in a way that the government's not big enough or interested enough in doing. They had powerful lobbying in Washington. <clears throat> you know, today, Alphabet spends more on lobbying in Washington than all of the union movement put together. 
Um, mm. So there's not much representation in Washington for working class people. And there are very few people with working class roots or working class values who are part of administrations or part of Congress. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's been a real loss. And so there's a lot of angry people who feel they're not, they're marginalized in spite of being a majority. Um, I always like the example of going back to my childhood again. Um, immediately after the Second World War, everybody thought Winston Churchill would be reelected in a landslide. You know, he's a mm. great war hero. And instead, they elected this labor government. This labor government was full of working class men. There were a woman or two, but mostly men. <clears throat> Seven members of the cabinet had started their lives on the coal face. Mm. You know, and they, that brought a completely different set of values. Um, Ernest Bevan, who was the illegitimate child of a prostitute in the west of England who'd grown up as a barrow boy and came up through the union movement, became arguably Britain's most successful foreign secretary. He stood up to Stalin, he played a key role in the development of NATO mm. and so on. And, you know, th these values seem to have vanished from our public life in a way that I think is a real loss. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm going to come back at, um, in a bit to the relationship between government and um, the the economy, the capitalist system. But well, I want to um, talk a little bit more about education. You write, um, the bachelor's degree has increasingly become a passport, not only to a good job, the kind of job that is worth doing and whose rewards have steadily increased over the last half century, but also to good health, to longevity, and to a flourishing social life. Without it, you risk being a second class citizen. What, what, what is the risk of being a second class citizen? Can you say more about that part? Well, citizenship is a lot more than just money. You know, it's participating and running society. You know, I was in an event, I was commenting on the Tanner lectures we had in Princeton just the other day. Hmm. And uh, I, I didn't have the microphone, so I couldn't answer this question. But a young man in the audience got up and said, how do we talk to those people? <laughs> And what I should have responded if I'd had the microphone and been quick enough would be, how about listening? <laughs> you know, and citizenship is about your views being heard. Um, and, you know, it takes us back to Hillary Clinton's comment about deplorables. You know, I mean, mm. there's this sense that we're not doing a very good job of being inclusive. And, you know, in my book, I lay some of that blame on economists for you know, thinking of economics as a te technocratic science like medicine or something, mm -hmm. in which case there's a right way to do something and not much variation in that. And so, you know, I think we've certainly enhanced that and made it more difficult. Yeah, you know, as a, as a psychologist, I always think that people are people and you can expect people to do what people do in the situations they find themselves in. So when things change, there has to be, I think, some outside circumstance to producing it. Yeah. So if people were being listened to before, working class people could um, participate in a meaningful way in society, um, and that is being diminished, you have to ask like, how or why? What's, what's happening in the society that's producing that? And so I, I'd love to hear what you think the role of, the gov of government has been in, in producing that, and separately, the role of private industry in producing that. Well, I think um, private industry has become much more hostile to power for working people. Um, you know, there's this quote I was reading just yesterday on a train where Alan Greenspan had said the most important event in 20th century economics was Ronald Reagan breaking the air traffic controllers union, you know. And it wasn't just that union, all those people got fired. It was open season on unions after that and private employers who'd much prefer not to have unions because you know or most of them would they they don't want their control um, threatened at all took that as a sort of license to say you know we don't need to do this um so that was part of it and they were very strongly supported in some states not all states by things like right to work laws hmm. um, which made it very hard for unions to fund themselves um, and, you know, there's been a lot of state-level action 
um, in which especially Republican-led or often dominated states where the governor, you know, the House and the Senate are all in Republican hands, of passing sometimes standardized packages of laws that are very pro-business and very anti-working people. So those would just be examples of things. There hasn't been a minimum wage increase for a very long time, though a lot of states have done it. So in some ways, there's been a shift of government action for ordinary people away from the center, which is sort of paralyzed now, to the states in which individual states are very far from paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of the story then is, is I understand it is in some sense, the, um, the capture of government by, by private industry or by the wealthy, that, that seems to be implied in what you're saying. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was very little corporate lobbying in Washington prior to 1970. You know, 1970 keeps coming up as a hinge date in this. Uh -huh. <laughs> the get a demorum for the, <laughs> working class aristocracy, sort of the blue collar aristocracy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, companies really moved into Washington in huge numbers. Um, healthcare is a big part of this story, too. An exorbitantly expensive healthcare system, which is messing up ordinary people's lives, especially messing up the government's life. And, you know, there are six healthcare lobbyists in Washington for every member, every legislator, you know, and they're not just sitting in their hands taking boat rides on the Potomac, you know, they're out there <laughs> trying to make things happen um, for the people who are paying their bills. And I think that's been a huge change. Um, some of that, funnily enough, was a sort of reaction to um, Ralph Nader. Mm. And, you know, Ralph Nader very successfully went after the Ford Motor Company. And, you know, the Ford Motor Company decided, boys, we've got to do something to stop this. And one of the things that came out of that was a big switch towards lobbying in Washington. So that's certainly been a part of the story. Got it. And you, you spent a lot of time talking about the rise, rising inequalities. So can you give us a sense of the, the scale of the inequality? I do that when you talk about life expectancy, you talk about um, the healthcare system and income. Like, give us a sense, help us understand the, the magnitude of the inequalities that you're, you're talking about. You know, that's, that's I, I'm going to resist that question a little bit. Okay. If, if you were an economist and asking me that, they would say, well, how much has the Gini coefficient gone up? You know? <laughs> how much has the share of the top 1% gone up? And a lot is the answer. <laughs> But to me, these other inequalities, these inequalities, say, in mortality by educational groups or inequalities in voice in politics, inequalities in participation, you know, what the um, philosophers like to call relational inequality. Mm. You know, are you a full member of society or are you not? Um, those, I think, are something that economists have not been very good in focusing on. They're, they will talk about Gini coefficients until you're so bored you <laughs> you know. But um, this is, the, these I think are as important. And, you know, we, we've certainly spent a lot of time talking about racial inequalities, which continue to be very important. Spent a lot of time talking about gender inequalities. Some of those have gotten better, some of those have gotten worse. But I, I like to switch the conversation when someone says, tell me about inequality. <laughs> I, I want to talk about inequalities. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think these are really important. And this one of life and death is just, you know, it's hard to get around that. Mm -hmm. And so you, you certainly aren't, <clears throat> in, my, in my experience, at least a standard economist when you don't want to talk about, you know, the, the uh, quantifiable. <laughs> so... Well, I talk about the quantifiable, but, you know, it's not the only stuff. Got it. Got it. So the other the other kind of one of the big things I'm interested in is, is this just an American phenomenon? Um, is this about the peculiarities of the American democracy and capitalism or is this a, a broader, a broader thing? I think it's a broader thing. Um, I think the mortalities, the deaths of despair are an American thing. Um, the only other place where that's happening on a similar scale is Scotland, where I come from, but not in Britain as a whole. Um, there's been a lot of deindustrialization in Scotland. 
there's also a big democratic deficit in Scotland, and the Scots don't much like being run by conservative politicians that they didn't vote for and don't like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that there's there's that. But I, I think of it as this being a range, you know, that American pathology is the worst. <laughs> but you see some similar things in other countries, like the populism, which we're seeing here, and which I think of as a reaction to some of this, is not unknown <laughs> elsewhere. We got Brexit in Britain, and Britain elected a clown as prime minister, you know, who clowned his way through COVID and killed large numbers of people. But you've got it in much better run places like in Germany and so on, where there are, you know, populists who are a real danger. Mm -hmm. So you, in, in a way you paint a, a somewhat bleak picture um, of, of where of where things stand. And I, and I guess I wonder, as you as you talk about this, if maybe the 50s to the 70s or like those two decades, those were anomalous and that really what's normal is is what we're you know what's expected is what we're seeing now given the systems we have do you what what's your view of that yeah you could argue that um <clears throat> i think of it as cycles more than you know if you go back in history far enough you'll find episodes you know the 30s with roosevelt were certainly a period where there was a lot of action on behalf of working people mm. and where pro-labor policies were passed and some people would put those together with the 50s through the 50s and 70s and say what's happening now is a return to what happened at the end of the 19th century where you had an oligarchic capitalist system um, which very much favored um, rich people um, at the expense of everyone. And if you want a picture of income inequality, it looks very like that too. It was very high during the Gilded Age. It's very mm -hmm. high again now. And it was very low in the middle of the period. So that's a, that very low, um, low frequency, long run thing um, does synchronize with that sort of story. But you go back even further and, you know, um, Jacksonianism was a sort of reaction of working class people to protest against you know, industrial capitalism, which had sort of come to America for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I think these things come and go. The trouble is, you know, you think of coming and going as being a stable thing. It's always going to go up and down. And so we just sit it out and come to the next round. But I think that's too dangerous. Um, you know, we could break something this time around. Mm -hmm. You never get it back. And there's issues like climate change, which were clearly not there before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you, you talk about those other those other periods where the working class were um, ascendant and um, you compare it to today. And I just I just wonder how much of it is um, about solidarity right among working class people. And when you have societies that are more fractured along lines other than, say, class. So in the United States, you have race, you have you know different dimensions in other places that makes it difficult for the working class or poor people to become ascendant? Like, how do you think about, about that? So in that sense, maybe the U.S. is just a harbinger because a lot of societies are becoming more diverse in a number of dimensions. Right. And also one has to be very careful, just going back to what we were talking about before, that, you know, what was happening on the income distribution was not what was happening to race, for instance. I mean, mm -hmm. so, you know, the progressive era at the beginning of the 20th century, which was very active in trying to promote working men. They were talking about white working men. They weren't very keen um, mm -hmm. on anything else. And they'd really bought into the sort of post reconstruction settlement in the South. So, you know, one always has to be careful about looking back and saying those were the good old days. You know, they were often the good old days for some, um, but not for others. Solidarity is a word I wrestle with. I think it's very important, and it's something that economists have not paid much attention to. I, I've done a lot of work with an activist in India, a man called John Dredd, who's a wonderful academic as well as uh, activist. He was born in Belgium, but he's an Indian citizen and has been very embedded in Indian movements of one sort or another. And for him, who's sort of in the trenches of doing this stuff, Solidarity is just an incredibly important thing. 
And I always think of that when you think of things like means-tested benefits, for instance, which economists love because they're efficient. You know, you're not distorting the market any more than you need to. But, you know, poor benefits for poor people tend to be poor benefits. And, you know, if the middle class doesn't benefit from them, they will not support them politically. And I think one of the reasons the British National Health Service has survived as long as it has um, you know, people sometimes say, well, the British National Health Service is a national treasure. Um, <laughs> then some of that is because the middle class benefited from it um, a great deal. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and ask, a, I'm going to ask, it's kind of two more areas. One is a very broad question, and the other one will get to your, the comment you made earlier about economists and how they do, how they go about their, their work. Um, the, the, the first kind of high level question, and this is connected to what something we were just talking about is, do you think capitalism is compatible with liberal, dem liberal democracy? You raise this question in your book, and I'm, I'm curious about your answer to that question. Um, if I knew the answer to that, I would be writing a book about that altogether. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I was reading something that Martin Wolf in the FT was writing today, and, you know, making the point that, um, you know, capitalism probably is compatible with liberal democracy. Unbridled capitalism probably is not, you know. And, you know, people, people these days are talking a lot about Karl Polanyi and, you know, these Polanyi moments when capitalism sort of gets out of hand and breaks the social roots on which it's based. And once it's done that, there's this double reaction that comes around and pulls it back in again. And I certainly think you can interpret history that way, that, you know, what happened in Britain in 1945 was sort of a reaction to the unbridled capitalism before them and pushing it back and saying, we've got to have these public goods and so on. You know, there was a reaction to, if you read early 19th century British economists and so on, they were worried about what they called the wage question, that wages were never going to rise. So there'd been this industri industrial revolution, but poor people just were not benefiting from it at all. And many people thought they never would, and it sort of inspired Marx and other writers at that time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, wages started rising, as my friend, one of my economic historian friends says, wages started rising the day that Marx published Das Kapital, you know. And so there, there's a sort of counter movement that comes back and may help with that. But I don't think if you just let it rip, if you try to have laissez-faire, um, that really is compatible um, with liberal democracy. Got it. I'm, I'm happy you brought up the, the writings of, of economists and um, ideologies that, that have been somewhat, you know, I, I would say Marx has, an, has a clear ideology um, about how goods and services should be distributed in, in society. But you write at one point, before the crisis, and you're referring to the 2009 financial crisis, many economists had promoted the elaborate financial engineering that underlay the collapse confident in the power of financial markets to create wealth and to regulate themselves. And you you um, lay the blame for some of the, the ills um, of the economy and its effect on people's lives on economics as a profession. Can you describe what you see as the, the fail failures? Of the yeah, I think we thought we knew better and we were wrong. <laughs> so I, I, I was wondering where you were going to go with that question because, you know, we can identify particular people who were involved in that. And I was hoping you weren't going to do that and you didn't because I, you know, I think of that as something that I was implicated in too. Mm -hmm. You know, we really thought, you know, I, when I was taught as an undergraduate, even in Cambridge in the 1960s, we were told that America had these bizarre financial regulations that went back to the Depression. You know, and there was no need for them anymore, but they were still there. And that was because people hadn't really learned how the world worked. Well, 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 you know, <laughs> the world is not as beneficent as we sometimes think it is. And, you know, these things are like you're touching off forces that you may not be able to control. Um, Keynes was very wise about these things. He was very dubious, you know, even in the 30s and 40s about letting these things rip and letting international capital movements go where they wanted to go. 
And I think we got very complacent, very arrogant. We'd been persuaded by our own models that these things could look after themselves, and we were wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I also wonder how much of it is um, justification for what people in power want to do and how much of it is actual cause. You know, how much of it, you know, is epiphenomenal. Like people want to do it. They need some explanation for it and stuff happens, but it's not causing the changes. And how much of these, the writings and thinking actually are causal. Yeah, I wrestle with that in my book, I think. I mean, you know, economists were pretty well paid for a lot of that advice. <laughs> and, you know, you could have this vision of, you know, um, large, rich people doling out money to economists to sing the songs that they wanted to sing. But I don't think it was all that. Um, and I think people really believed. And um, some of it was this thing we've talked about already, which is the people who were running, you know, having treasury secretaries who come from Goldman Sachs, for instance, you know, it means they grow up in an atmosphere and these things really did work for them. And, you know, they may have very good motives, but they think they're going to work for the world as a whole and will take risks that ex post we should not take. Mm -hmm. So I think it's both, actually. I mean, I think the power of ideas is very important. I mean, there's a new biography, which I haven't read yet, of Milton Friedman, which came out, I think, just yesterday, the day before, mm -hmm. by Jennifer Burns. And, you know, Friedman's ideas were very, very important. And I don't think he was entirely bought um, by the forces that were benefiting from those ideas. And there have been good historians like Angus Bergen's book on Mont Perlin and so on, which talked about that interaction. And it is an interaction. It's not just the economics profession being bought off by powerful interests, though there's plenty of that going on too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, given that this is the, the world we live in right now, if it were up to you, what would be the, I don't know, the two or three things you think would have to change um, now for the this kind of trend of this in, in these increasing inequalities the reduction in you know um or the reduction in lifespan for working class people those things to change course i think two things um both of which are probably unattainable but they're not completely unattainable so if they were <clears throat> one is um i think campaign finance reform or campaign finance is a big problem, which is less of a problem in Europe. So that our representatives spend most of every day raising money to stay elected instead of working for the people who elected to represent them. And that means that deep pocketed industries like healthcare or pharmaceuticals um, or any large effect, big tech um, has huge influence over individual lawmakers um, through the power of money. And you, in most places in the United States, you can't even think about running for Congress without either having the money yourself or having a deep pocketed backer um, behind you. And I think that doesn't work very well. Um, and I know there are lots of deep First Amendment issues underneath that, but I think, you know, the Constitution has been reshaped before and could be reshaped again. Um, and that, to me, would help a lot. And I talk to Democratic politicians who say very much the same thing, that without a reform to that, you're not really going to make much progress on this. The second thing is we, we have a healthcare system which is sucking the blood out of our politic body, as it were. And it's partly that it costs so much. So... You know, we're spending twice as much as most other countries as a share of GDP. And the numbers are huge. So that, you know, if you take the difference between what we spend as a share of GDP and what the Swiss spend, and the Swiss are the second most expensive, that money is about a trillion dollars a year, which would pay for 1.5 times the total military expenditure in the U.S. You know, we're not talking about beams here. We're talking mm. Um, real money. The second thing is it's financed by what is effectively a flat tax on workers so that um, the, um, you know, basically you're not, when you buy health insurance, you're insuring your body, not your salary. Right? 
which means that if you have a CEO who's being driven around by a chauffeur, the chauffeur's health insurance costs about the same as the CEO's health insurance. It's just not hugely different because you're insuring the body, not the salary. Except that that premium, which is between, you know, it's like $11,000 a year, maybe 30% of what the driver is being paid, and it's nothing compared to what the executive is being paid. So you get rid of all the drivers. <laughs> mm -hmm. You get automated cars, or you have a driver service that doesn't give health insurance to its workers. And so that's done terrible things to labor markets for less educated people, while not really affecting educated people at all. That's spiking up inequality. It's killing jobs, good jobs, for less educated people. It's also the case that it's screwing up our government. So, you know, your ex-colleague Vic Fuchs, who died the other day, um, had been saying this for years. Alan Blinder has been saying this too, which is that um, almost we'll never get close the federal deficits in Washington until we can control health care costs. Mm -hmm. And if we can control health care costs, we can bring those deficits under control. And mm -hmm. so if you think of all the poison in Washington that circulates around deficits, you know, fixing our health care system would fix that. And of course, Switzerland has five years extra life expectancy over what we have. Mm -hmm. Well, those are those are um, great things, I think, to for us to, to think about. And the politics seem almost impossible, as you as you mentioned. <laughs> I mean, I guess it will be a matter of um, the population and the mass of the mass of people deciding this has to happen. But right now, I, I have to say I'm I'm a little I'm a little discouraged. I am too. I'm sorry, but you know, I I think it's good to keep talking about the healthcare thing though, because I don't think people understand just how much harm it's doing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, pushing those facts, which I push every time they get a chance. Um, I think might help because otherwise this, this is an unsustainable system. And the truth about unsustainable systems is they stop eventually mm -hmm. and it could stop well through a uh, well organized reform or it could stop badly through God knows what happens. And it would do a lot to get the former rather than the latter. Well, great. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. It's been really interesting. Me Thank too. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's been very pleasurable. Great. So um, we'll we'll be um, back next week um, with another very interesting speaker to touch on um, the tensions between business, civic society, and government. Thank you. Thank you.